let's talk about rabbits. So again, we want to make sure we have a goal. Do we want to produce them for meat or are we producing them for fur? Or are we producing them for a companionship type animal? Obviously, if it's companionship, we're not worried about the carcass here. But we need to have that goal in the back of our mind. Uh, in this purposes of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the fact that you're looking at a meat rabbit for consumption. So with that said, there's basically three breeds that do an excellent job in our environment that we have to work with. The first breed is a New Zealand white rabbit. Uh, they're the typical white rabbits. They're going to have red to pinkish color eyes, and they're going to get to be about 12 pounds at maturity. So they're a rather large rabbit, which also means they're going to be a little later maturing, but they're going to do a really good job on producing lots of meat for you on a regular basis. Now they've got a cousin, which is the New Zealand red. So if you don't want the, the white pelt, uh, you can get the same version, but in a real pretty red color. Uh, and again, they're going to be about a 12 pound carcass. Now there's another one that you can use, which is called the Californian. And a Californian is really distinctive. A lot of people call them the paints of the rabbit industry, but you'll notice that they'll have black ears, black noses, typically black feet, and sometimes they'll have some black spots on the rest of their body. Uh, but that black and white appearance on those is a real good telltale sign of the breed. So these are Californians, and they'll get to be about 10 pounds, so a little bit smaller than the New Zealand's, uh, but they still are good meat producers. Now there are larger breeds that you can get into, but those larger breeds don't necessarily confer good meat quality. The larger the breeds have to have bigger bones, so the meat to bone yield isn't quite as good, as well as the meat quality itself isn't quite as good as in the Californians or in the New Zealand breeds. So let's, we're assuming that you've got some rabbits at home, we gotta feed them so we can get something out of them. Uh, this is a, a nice little food pyramid that I found online, and basically I, I agree with most of this as a nutritionist. Uh, rabbits do need an unlimited hay supply. Uh, and that can come in the form of Timothy orchard grass, oat hay, brome, Bermuda grass. Uh, and then down here in small letters, they say only very small amounts of alfalfa, if any, check with your vet. I agree with the fact that you need to check with your vet. But as a nutritionist, we can feed alfalfa to them. We just want to make sure we have the right quality of alfalfa that we're going to use for those rabbits. And the next thing we can use is we can use fresh vegetables. They, they love fresh vegetables on a daily basis. Uh, then they have up here pellets of a little bit smaller percent of the diet or lesser use. I, I would disagree with this. You can have pellets down here and have that as the only feed component because today's commercially available pellets are fortified with vitamins, they're fortified with minerals, and they're gonna match the, the rabbit's nutritional uh, re, uh, requirements for protein and energy. So you can get along very well with feeding just commercialized pellet feed back to your rabbits. Uh, one thing I do up here agree is they say very, very limited, if any, treats. And they're going to call treats to be uh, fresh fruits, uh, things of that sort. And definite no-nos is no yogurt, no candies, no sugar type uh, products for the rabbits. So let's think about some housing that we're going to put this rabbits in. Uh, this is just a real simple uh, commercially available single rabbit hutch. So if you just want the rabbits for companionship, that's an easy alternative, easy way to, to store those rabbits or house those rabbits uh, in your backyard. But if you want rabbits for a little bit different purpose, for that meat production, uh, this is what I call the rabbit condo. And the reason I call it a rabbit condo is you see we've got three hutches at the bottom here, we've got several hutches, three hutches at the top. Uh, and this can be as big or as small as you want it. And they've got it automated, they've got a Tupperware container sitting up here that's got plumbing going to it. So that way they've got an automatic water system. The rabbits never run out of good quality fresh water. And that's real important because you think about a rabbit during the heat of the summer, they're wearing a fur coat and they can't take it off. So we need to make sure we supply them with lots of clean, fresh water for them to drink. The other thing, if you're gonna do the rabbit condo, you need to make sure that you have a diversion between the first floor and the second floor. Uh, that way the, the guys on the first floor aren't getting defecated and urinated on. It diverts all those droppings to the back of the hutch area, so it lands out here on the ground. And if you notice, these folks are allowing their chickens to go in there and clean up some of those droppings just the same. Now, one thing we need to keep in mind is rabbits are of the rodent family. And what that means is their teeth continually grow throughout their life cycle. So if we have them in a situation where they're in an all-metal hutch like this, 
and we don't supply them with a source of wood for them to gnaw and chew on, this is what happens. Their teeth will get pretty nasty looking. They'll continue to grow. They'll get this overbite situation. This rabbit here is not going to be able to effectively ingest enough food to be productive. Uh, so this is a, a very serious situation we get into. Uh, so we need to make sure we provide them with supplemental wood for them to chew on all day, every day. If you're going to uh, raise babies and have a meat production type situation, uh, there's two different styles of nest boxes that are out there. Uh, the first one that's easily made at home and probably the cheapest is just a wooden plywood nest box. Now, rabbits like to chew on wood. So this works well, but you're going to have to replace it over time because the does are going to sit there and continue to nibble and, and eat on that. I used, when I raised rabbits when I was younger, uh, these commercial metal boxes. They've got a removable pegboard wooden floor in the bottom, which works well. It gets a little airflow for the kits to be able to have fresh air, but at the same time, it's not too much and it's removable so it's easy to clean after the kits are removed from the nest box. Don't be alarmed when a doe gets close to having her babies, she's gonna pull the fur out from her chest area and out from her underline. This is a natural nesting instinct that a rabbit will have as she's building a nest for these babies to be born and to, to grow up in. When a baby rabbit is born, they're, they're hairless, they're, they're naked, and their eyes are closed. So they have to have, they have a lot of dependence on the doe to make sure that they are born into the proper environment that's safe for them. Now, just like we talked about in chickens, that there are certain t weather extremes that we have to worry about. Obviously, with a rabbit, we usually don't have to worry about, especially in the Oklahoma area, about cold weather because they do have that fur coat on. That's, that's a vacation for them when we get into what we consider cold temperatures in our part of the country. But on the flip side of that, hot weather is extremely detrimental to a rabbit, especially if we don't provide the proper care for them. So as I said earlier, make sure we have lots of good, high quality, clean, cool drinking water available for the rabbits to be able to consume on a daily basis. It doesn't take very long without water source and in a high temperature situation that you can get into a critical condition with your rabbits. Also something that a lot of people will do is they'll have multiple of these bottles and they'll freeze those bottles in their, in their refrigerator freezer and then they'll provide one of these to the rabbits on a daily basis. The other thing you can use would be fans. Uh, supplying a fan with a mister in the front of that fan blowing directly on the rabbits will help keep them a little cooler as well. Obviously shade is critical and shade is extremely important for them to have. So let's talk about the production cycle. A litter of babies, we call the babies kits, takes 31 days to gestate. So once we breed that doe, 31 days later, she should be having a, baby, a bunch of kits for us. There's usually anywhere from eight to 10 kits in a litter. Uh, that number can vary greatly. It could be just as small as a few. And I have actually had does that have, have had up to 12 and 13 kits in a litter. Uh, the 12 and 13 is a little harder for her to be able to manage and to raise all of them, but a good doe can make that happen and, and get those babies raised up. Uh, fryer rabbit size is four to five pounds and it's gonna take you eight to 12 weeks to get there. Uh, so not a very long time frame to get them to the point where they're edible and supply a high protein source for you. Breeding age on rabbits is seven to eight months of age. Those larger breed rabbits are gonna be a little bit older to reach that maturity. One advantage to rabbits is they're not photosensitive or daylight sensitive, so they'll breed year round and produce year round for you with no problems. So with that, that's all I've got for y'all today. Uh, we'll take questions at the break, uh, but uh, I do encourage you to think about uh, the backyard farming for rabbits and chickens. Uh, they're a great high protein source that you can grow in a small confined area. And you can actually, if you do it right, you can have multiple species, the chickens and the rabbits, in the same footprint in the same area. So I think they're an excellent opportunity for a backyard farmer to be able to utilize. Thank you.